Hi everyone, my name is Rashi. I'm the Executive Director of Yoga Service Council. And today as part of our Yoga and Resiliency series that we are um, running, I'm talking to the amazing and talented and like all sorts of jazz, L. And um, Elle and I have known each other from being on the board of the Chicago Women's Health Center. And uh, Elle is also the founder of Affirmative um, Health and Healing in Chicago as well. So Elle, thank you so much for being part of this and taking time out to talk about all sorts of shit. <laughs> thank you so much, Rajni, for having me. I love that. I love the introduction. You know, I was getting all jazzed up. I know, I know girl. <laughs> You're talking about me, I'm liking it. Uh, in moment. <laughs> so we, I want to talk about, we're going to talk about your childhood. We're going to talk about Mama Doll. Um, I want to talk about you living in two different worlds at the same time. And then I want to talk about your perspectives and your opinions about, you know, your spiritual practices and meditation and how it kind of lent to the building of strength and compassion and resiliency, and then just kind of where we're at in the world today. Yeah? That's a boatload of stuff. It's a shitload of stuff. And we're gonna <laughs> okay, I think I'm down for that. Yeah, all right, so, so I know you're from Alabama. I know you were born and raised in Alabama, and I know you were raised by a really beautiful soul called Mama Doll. Can you talk to us a little bit about her? Yeah, I can. Um... So yes, I was raised in actually Newmarket, Alabama by my great, great grandmother. So she was in her 90s when I was a little, little bit of a person. And she really took care of me as I was growing up. I, my fondest memories of her are like working in the yard and the garden. We lived in, like I said, like a, almost like on a farm where we were surrounded with gardens that sustained us, fruit trees, walnut trees, pecan trees. We had chickens, we had pigs, we had everything that we needed at the time. And then also behind our house, was a, like a, a wooded area, a treed and wooded area where she would often go and visit and dig up roots and pick flowers and berries. So I would just follow her along, catching and holding on to her skirt and watching everything that she did in the gardens. And, and those are like my most memorable moments of just being with her out in nature. So you were kind of like, you yeah you just roll around the dirt with her all the time and just learning from her it sounds like is that kind of what your your childhood yeah. was yeah 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 i was just open and free i had i mean she was in her 90s so she didn't have a lot of energy to discipline me so i remember being just like a wild child running around i would go out and as early as i could during the day and i would stay out all night sometimes i would sleep underneath the stars and she would allow me to do that. So I didn't have a lot of what kids have today in terms of structure. Yeah. I didn't have a schedule. I didn't go to school until very late. So I skipped over the kindergarten stuff until I was forced to go to school in first grade. So it was, it was a very just creative, use your imagination kind of time. Because after all, I was the only child and not around so many older wise people and so I was just like a little ball of energy by myself you know surrounded by their love and so it was it was it was just I think just a magical period of time in my life you're right like kids are raised differently now you know kids are very raised differently to have that kind of freedom and exploration when you're a kid that's such a gift you know, because I mean, I have my own bias of when you go to school here, I feel like they kind of put you into a box. So, you know, it's nice that when, you know, for those of us that have been able to have freedom, you know, as kids to explore ourselves. And so as you were growing up and you would kind of catch on to mama, mom doll's skirts and kind of walk around the fields and the farms, what was she like? Because eventually I want to, eventually we'll talk about her essence and how her essence is into you and how that has created and formed and been a part of your life 
and how you relate to the world around you. So what, if you could describe the essence of Mama Doll, what was that? You know what, now that it it has actually taken me until like now getting older to understand who she really was. Mm -hmm. So if I were to put her into words right now, it would be, she was like a healer, a healer of the earth. And so like the mother of all kind of thing. And she didn't, she didn't speak very much. She didn't have a lot of words to say, so she wasn't very chatty, but she would move in such a way that you clearly understood what she was saying. I remember just watching her hands move or she would move her hands in a certain way to say, you know, go over here. That It was almost like she played some musical instrument on the wind that I didn't know what it was. And she also was, when I say a healer, For our community, she made tea, she made little sachets of different herbs for different ailments. I remember people coming to the house, knocking on our door in the middle of the night, asking for something, whether they had a stomach ache or they had something more traumatic, like all the hair fell out or something like that. She always had a remedy for everything. She would just get up, not say a word, listen, and go off, hmm. And then, you know, put some things together and hand it out. And, you know, she supported and gave of herself in that way. And I think maybe till she was like 97, 98. That's a long time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. If you, so she was, and I know that, you're also an herbalist. And so we're going to get into that eventually as well. So when you look at kind of how Mama Doll was and the environment that she raised you in, and she was a healer, you know, when did, let's talk a little bit about, you know, those moments, whether it was in childhood or later on, where, you know, you learned about how she learned about herbs and how she learned how to be part of the the earth and work with it and from it. How did that happen? So, you know, I think that part is a magical part. I'm not even sure that I know how she knew anything. So, and I'm I'm actually, you know, coming from a place where we lived in a cinder block house with a tin roof mm-hmm. and a pot belly stove in the, in the living room where we didn't have much. So if, by today's standards, it would look like dirt poor. Mm-hmm right? Like we didn't have anything. We didn't have, you know, indoor plumbing. Mm-hmm. And this is the time that you should have indoor plumbing. <laughs> everybody had it. I think, yeah, everybody in the world had it probably, but we didn't. And we, I always felt as if I had everything with her. And so, I mean, I was never hungry. She gave, you know, we had everything that we needed. I was never cold or uncomfortable and I was open and happy. And so I think when I think about how she learned things, she learned things from being observant in her environment. And she also learned from her mother and watching her mother so many years ago Um, She explained to me that actually her mother was one of the last descendants of slaves, I think possibly illegally in the Mm -hmm. United States. I don't have the records of it, but words of mouth that her mother was an herbalist from wherever she came from. And she was able to adopt and adapt to the new um, plant and you know the new herbs that were here and start doing some of her own traditions and she passed it on to Mama Doll but I think at the same time Mama Doll was so young you know that I don't know how she got everything in her head and I'm just thinking like maybe she she just she just connected to, you know, nature. And she was just always in nature, feeling like balanced and happy. And I don't know, maybe she just learned it that way as well. Trial and error. She had a long time to do it, 80 years. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, 
Yes, she did. Yes, she did. <laughs> so, so let me let's um, let me go back because you said something really interesting where you mentioned that Mama Doll's mom, who would have been your great 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 grandmother. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So she was, as far as you know, in your family, right? Three greats. <laughs> yeah, three greats. I think okay. so. Three. Okay. So, so, you know, you mentioned that she was, she was the last kind of, you know, from the, the slaves that were brought over from that time and era, the last time that, that it, you could, you're able to trace your family lineage and ancestry back to that. Do you recall, or do you have some type of perception of where like that, you know, where your ancestry is back? I have no idea. Now, I did do my Ancestry.com, and it has a hodgepodge of whole, a whole bunch of different things mixed in. But actually, my three greats, I have no idea where she came from. Mm, okay. So there's a loss of ancestry, or there's somewhere record-keeping something and just didn't happen. Right. Cool. Yeah. Interesting. And, I, you know, it's, it's, I, I know that you know, and that I think every, like it's, it's hard to go back that far and be able to trace that full line of ancestry that that um is there for sure absolutely absolutely and i think that's like one of the one of the things as african american in the united states as a that's a challenge is not knowing your lineage all the way back and not being able to pass on and know who you were and who you once were and who your people were and what your traditions were what your religion um, was at one time. And um, so I've always felt a little bit of a gap in not knowing it. But for some reason, like with my meditation practice, mm -hmm. I still feel maybe it's true, maybe it isn't, as if I'm still able to connect to mm -hmm. my ancestry and my ancestral lineage through that way, regardless of what my mind actually knows about them. Yeah, I would agree. I think the spiritual practice or spiritual practices and meditation practices can, it's like they, they transcend the boundaries of what we construe as time, you know, and knowledge, like whatever the mind thinks it knows, it, it, that resonance just goes beyond the mental faculty. Absolutely. So do you feel, so as you were, you know, raised by Mama Doll and you were like a child of the earth and you were kind of, you know, moving through the world and, and before you went into the traditional school system, um, you know, do you remember some things that Mama Doll would, would say to you and talk to you about that was related to who you were, how you were, you know, coming into the world? Do I remember anything that she would say to me? You know, she said very little. She said very little, but I think if I were to think about something that she said to me that has actually made a huge difference in my life, it has been whenever you feel like you don't know your way, stop and listen to the wind. Mm -hmm. And that is something I often, I would often see her do, is sitting, sinking in, and gliding out, you know, and just allowing her senses to listen to the wind and give direction. And that's something I have actually used throughout my entire life. If I get into a spot, like the spot that I'm in right now, trying to find some real estate in Chicago, and I'm frustrated. <laughs> I'm frustrated. COVID-19 real estate. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was like, what? Um, but I had to ground myself, sink, sink in, and just listen to the wind and allow the wind to take me to wherever I need to go. And that's something that is invaluable that I learned from her. So that habit of listening to the wind and being in the earth and 
following the essence of Mama Doll through her hands as she, she kind of moves through her world and moves through in and out of your experiences and you moved in and out of her experiences. You know, when we talk about how strength is built in a child over time, you know, how it's, how it's almost sometimes imposed on a child over time as they age, do you, do you feel that all of these things kind of lent to how your own inherent connection with the world and therefore how you built strength and compassion? Like, how, do you, let's talk about that a little bit. How did that come about? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I feel as if, if I had not been raised in the environment with her specifically, mm -hmm. with her specifically, there's no way that I would be the person that I am today. Because, you know, I'm talking to you and I'm thinking about and I'm envisioning her, you know, standing there in the garden and how she would move. And now with Zoom, I can see myself. <laughs> and it's almost like I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not channeling her, but I am, you know, I'm still just so much a part of her, like water flows, you know water flows in a river and or a stream where it's just one body but there's you know multiple particles and multiple drops and i feel like that that maybe i'm i'm i am as fluid as i am as a person and flexible as i am as a person because i had that experience with her i watched her mm. during those formative years so i mean i I observed the way that she would take time. And now I find myself in that same habit, you know? It's, it's so natural for me to do it because I watch her do it all the time. Yeah, right. when, I, when I didn't re realize what, it, what she was actually doing. But now it clicks. Yeah. Love it. And I feel um, it's just always something special when you have it's just nice to have grandparents around. You had like great, great, great grandparents around. Oh, I had the great, great. And you know what? So my great, so mom and all my, it wasn't my great, great, but my great grandmother lived across the, the field. <laughs> so <laughs> they were next door neighbors. <laughs> yeah. They were I, mean, next, yeah. I was surrounded by the elders. <laughs> You were, you had this whole, like, you had access to, you know, elders and, you know, your ancestors through them. I mean, there was so much that you had access to. It was brilliant. And so, like, with all of this happening, and then, you know, you, then you ended up going to traditional school. And so, let's chat a little bit about you, you moving, you know, on to a tra traditional school and, and how that coping, like, how did you cope with that? How did you deal with that? What was that process? First grade, I can remember first grade like it was yesterday. I mean, it was like the first part of first grade was so traumatic to me to have to ask to go to the to the bathroom, to the restroom. What? You know, I have to eat at the same time. We have, I have to eat lunch at the same time and I don't have any choices like, or I, if I brought my lunch in, you know, it's not fresh because it was made that morning and I wasn't accustomed to, to that. I was accustomed to eating when I was hungry mm -hmm. and relieving myself when I was ready to relieve myself and just to sit in the classroom and listen and then do this regimen and to do this and do that. I had the hardest time paying attention and connecting with my classmates because I was the only child, I was out by myself, you know, most of the time. And now I have a classroom of people, of other children that are, you know, very active, not as much as, you know, I was active, but this was a different type of active. And so I found myself literally just like gazing out of the window, looking at the trees, through the window pane and watching the leaves, you know, dreaming of some, being someplace else, dreaming of being home under my big tree and just using my imagination just to be someplace else. 
And that's what I did to cope. I just stared into space and left my body and traveled on. Mm -hmm. School at that time, it was just not the place for me. Mm -hmm. I can so relate to that. So <laughs> when you're dealing with this, environment it's not for every child <laughs> sitting down that meant long period of time now they say okay now every i would have like adhd you know and have some type of adderall or something prescribed to me because i'm not that child that can sit in the seat yeah, yeah. very difficult so aside from the fact that you not only had to adjust to a regime, basically a child of the earth to now having to sit still in a classroom, um, and you're coping, you're, you're, you're working with, you know, this inherent, um, uh, this inherent desire to almost escape and yet know that you have to be in this arena. You know, was there, were there other external factors that contributed to that in any way? I mean, yes, you were in a different environment, but did you, was the school environment very different? I mean, were, did people, were, were there black people there with you? Were there white kids? Were there people of color? Was there any of that that you had to get accustomed to since you went to a traditional school system? Oh, yeah. So the, the school system that I went to, it was predom a pre predominantly white school. Mm. There were very few black um, children in the school. And then also I was spending a lot of time. With, so when I went to school, I was living with my mother. Mm -hmm. So not only did I have a difference in my school environment, I was also living away from Mama Doll in a different city with my mother, who's a totally different person. Like, <laughs> totally different person she was you know younger for one moving around talking telling me this telling me that do this do that do this do that you know how mothers are you know and so not only was I in a different environment with people at school different ages at school different races at school but my home environment was totally different it was more you know, cut, 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 yeah. you know, not flow. Mm. We had a routine at home, take the bath, you know, the same stuff we do with children today or getting up to go to work. This has to be done by this time and this has to be done by this time. You eat it this time. And my mother was very much so that way. Mm. She worked, so. We had to get all of the things in. Yeah. It was very challenging. <laughs> this was a did, very challenging time for me. <laughs> did it help? I mean, did, was, so, you know, you've got, so there's an environment coming in, people are looking different from you and then your home environment is different. Like what, what happened? So what happened when you went into your mind and went off? you know, away from the present moment when you were a kid, what were you, what was happening? And did it ever get triggered by something? And, and you know where I'm going, like you're, you look different, you're in a different school. I went to a predominantly white school at some point too. And it's like, you look different, you feel different. People say shit, you know, like that. Did any of those experiences cause an even more desire or a natural tendency to kind of go off? Nope, I can't think of any triggers. I can't think of any, any triggers other than just being there. Mm. So, you know, this is good. This is like, and I, and I actually still do the, the same thing today. If I'm under so much and I'm in the zone, I feel constrained. I just drift away. And I could drift away once an hour, depending on the day. I'm so serious. <laughs> I am so serious. It's amazing that I can get anything done. But yeah, it's, it has nothing to do with that um, in, in terms of when I was in school, a specific trigger. It was just being in that environment. Now, now that I'm older, I tend to do it more when, I'm, when I feel like I'm getting into a box. 
Mm-hmm. Or I'm getting into a place where I need to make a decision. Mm-hmm. I'm getting to a space where I recognize that there's chaos, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, chaos. A lot of stuff is moving around. Let me figure out what, I, what am I supposed to be doing? That's what my mind thinks. And then I drift. And that drifting process is your way of looking at all the information that's coming to you and making sense of it. Right. Just daydreaming about someplace better than where I am. (laughs) (laughs) The beach, a tree house on the top of a mountain, watching the sunrise somewhere across, you know, a canyon. (laughs) I'm telling you, we know all that. We know this by now that you you're off in a canyon in your world and get your mind is processed and all that stuff in the background. It's like, it's what it needs to be able to figure it out. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so I want to jump a little bit. So you went and you stayed with, you know, mom environments are all different and you're going through, and now I want to get a little bit more into kind of what the current environment is that we are looking at with like, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and just knowing that Black communities have always had to deal with this always since, you know, 400, 500 years. I mean, it's always been around. So I want to get into kind of that arena a little bit to understand how you related to it when you were a kid. So I I know we've talked about this before, but there was um, uh, a memory that you have in which you're driving with your mom and there's an individual that got out of the car and got really angry. Like, can you tell us a little bit about that? And then I want to understand how you coped with that particular incident in that moment. Yeah, so so I I remember that actually, and I thought, and I said to myself, this is my, this was my first experience with racism, Mm -hmm. which I'm probably saying that out of like a little bit being naive because my first, my first experience with race, racism was living the way that I lived, you know, actually on, on my homestead that I love so much, which was a former um, plantation field that my family care, um, well, the sharecropped and somehow came to own it, but were paid pennies, mm. pennies and pennies and pennies, and then living in, you know, poverty for years and years and years without any options. My mama doll only made it to third grade Mm. because she was, she had to leave school to work the fields. That was her, her options. Mm. So that was due to oppression and and racism. But when I, when I think about an event, I think about the time of my mother, she picked me up from Mama Dolls and we were driving to the store and we're going down this long windy road in you know rural Alabama and there's a pickup truck in front of us and my mom is driving her red Mustang is a like I think is a Mach 1 and she has these small tires in the front and these big tires in the back and she liked to you know drive it pretty fast and my mom is a you know very small petite woman at the time, but she looked like, uh, she's so big in the car and I'm sitting in the front seat. And, you know, I don't think I'm wearing my seatbelt because these were during the times where seatbelts weren't required. I'm showing my age now. And we're just going down this winding road. And I remember this pickup truck is not going so fast and my mom gets closer to it. And the pickup truck in front, it just stops real fast. She stops, she's taken off guard. The guy, the driver, an older white male, he gets out and he goes to the bed of the truck and he grabs a baseball bat and he comes over to the car. And I'm sitting in the front seat, I think eight years old. And he has the bat and he shakes the bat at my mom. He's like, you, you know those words. Don't you trail behind me. Don't you tailgate me. I will bust windows out of your car. I will. You. And I I remember seeing the grit in his teeth. 
like he was snarling. You know, I'm I'm probably making a horrible face, but he was like, you know, you could just see that with the bat. That scared me. <laughs> it like it really scared me because that was, and I'm thinking. Why are you so angry? She didn't, you know, my mom didn't hit your car. You know, she's a woman in the car. And you feel as if you can just unleash this terror on us because we're too close. And it's not even just, it's, and we all know it's, close or not close, it's because you're black, especially with those words. Yes. You talk about that grit, like that teeth, you know, and that sheer kind of anger that comes from a place of just like, like it seems, it, it sounded like, I've heard this story before, so it's like it, it was in his bones almost the level of angst it was in his bones and you're there as a child and your mom is there and there's confusion and there's like like what the hell is this like how is this even happening did something settle into your bones at that moment or when you thought about it later i mean it apparently because i can remember it and, you know, it's not necessarily that I remember his exact words. I remember him saying, you know, the N word, of course, and that he's gonna hurt my mom, of course. I remember that. I remember the shaking of the bat, of course. But what I remember the most is his face and the way he moved his lips and the way he gritted his teeth and talked through his teeth like he was so angry. And the way I felt when I went, like, I felt like waves coming over me, but the way that he moved. And, you know, and I, I realize that now because maybe, because I'm a very empathic person, when the way that someone moves in a room shapes my mood or can interact with my mood, I notice it, I feel it, I feel when people move. And so to see someone move so angrily, you know, angrily, when I didn't experience anger like that in my life, I mean, I'm coming from a place where I'm with elderly people who can barely like say good morning. You know, they're not angry at all. No one's angry. No one's angry at my house, you know. And, and now all of a sudden I'm like, what is this? What is this? What is it and why? And that's what settled with me. Why? Why? Why are you so angry? Why are you so hurt? And why are you putting it on me? Did you end up having a conversation? And I know you were little, so did, did whether it was now or later, you know, was there a conversation between your mom and you or if mom at all found out about that incident? Was there any dialogue about it when you were a kid? My mom. I, do you know what? I haven't even really talked to my mom about it. I don't remember talking to my mom about it. You had to deal with it all your, you, not saying that it's, it's anybody's fault, but you, there was this internalization and you had to figure out a support structure for yourself and process it for yourself. Right. My mom was processing. I could, you know, my mom probably was processing it herself and was disturbed by it and just was like putting it in this box. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, <laughs> something's falling in the room behind me. Um, so, you know, you said something really interesting, which I think comes up as we, and, and we're, we're getting a little bit more into the adulthood now, but I want to go back a little bit where you said, you know, the oppression and racism and all that stuff that you experienced, it, it was, it, it happened in a way of your upbringing in the poverty that you kind of moved up in, but it didn't occur to you until later on. Absolutely. I had no idea that, <laughs> I had no idea my, my skin color was a problem. 
it didn't impact me in my life and my well-being. I had no idea. When you think back about that and you think back about how it didn't impact you and how it impacts you now, where, where is L? Where is L in this? You know, when I think about it now, I think, you know, just like, for example, land and education, access, you know, having access to things. So like now where I am in my career, even though I've worked 25 years, drug development, chemistry, my family has worked and struggled really, you know, hard to get to only a small percentage, you know, of wealth in the United States. Mm. We, we didn't have the opportunity to, to buy homes. The banks wouldn't loan you money, even if we had money from our, our farms. Mm. We couldn't spend it to buy any land. I'm very thankful that my family was able to acquire the land that they had, but that was very rare. Do you do you remember this? Um, do you remember the story of how that happened? Because I, I think you mentioned that you know it was it was from the plant it was plantation land that your uh, family ancestry and lineage had, you know. They ended up sharecropping it. Sharecropping, that's right, that's right, that's right. So that's how it kind of all came about. And do you remember, was it, was it Mama Doll's generation that was able to kind of acquire the land or did it come from her mom that they were able to, to do that? No, it was her generation. It was actually more probably her, um, her children. Okay, got it, got it. Okay, cool. Um, and I'm just asking for all of this because I think it's important for people to understand stories. I think it's people, it's important for people to understand that resiliency and strength is all built in a myriad of different ways. And, and I think it's things that you really love and enjoy, like your kids, like you don't realize what the backstory is of something or where you're living. And as you get an adult, you do get to realize it. And I think when you get to be an adult and you realize it in that way, things just it's almost like you see the world a little bit differently. At least I know I saw the world a little bit differently, not because I had your type of experience. There were other experiences being, you know, Indian, but I feel like that when you get to an, a, an adult and you process these events and these emotions, it's almost as if like you don't know where you're supposed to be in the world. Oh, absolutely. I feel that way. And I feel like, just like, you know, when we're talking about redlining, when cities actually create barriers in, in, to divide people so that certain groups are in certain areas, certain groups are on this side of the freeway and other groups are on this side of the freeway. That's by design, right? So to ensure the economic wealth or the economics of a specific city in terms of land ownership, real estate values, you know, property, not just property, but also how um, companies pay tax. And then, of course, that tax revenue feeds into the school system and the level of education that you're able to attain in this, you know, environment, socioeconomic environment, even though public education is free to all, everyone doesn't get the same level of education, right? There are boxes. And so for me personally, is like I realize that there are, there are always days or instances that I realize I've been put in a box. Now, in that, in, in so many different ways, in so many different levels, my box is not just my schedule, my work schedule. You know, and I know a lot of people feel this way, you know, in terms of gender, right? So it's like Pandora's box or the little box game that we used to play where the nested, the little nested dolls. Do you remember those little nested dolls? You know, bigger one going, open that one, it's another small one inside of that and another small one inside of that. How many nested dolls does it take for you to get, you know, out? How many, how many have you been, how many have been placed in there for you in your situation? Right? 
Some of us have three. Some of us have eight. Some of us have 20, right? So we're not all starting at the same place. Even though it appears that we all should be. Yeah, yeah. And let, let, let me, let's, I want to dive a little bit, just a tiny bit deeper into that, where it's like, yeah, you, from the outside, and we've talked about this before, where it's, if it's from the outside, you seemingly should have had the same level of education because you were seemingly in a close enough by neighborhood. And, you know, seemingly is the key word, like all of these things should be stacked. And so, you know, like uh, you, like a black girl and a white girl should have the same level from the outside perspective. And yet there's no real grounding understanding of the, the fact of all of these other things play a role that nobody sees. Absolutely. You know what was a good example of that? When I graduated from high school and I went to college for, for chemistry, my first degree in chemistry, um, I made great grades in high school and I went to a predominantly black high school and I was in actually in the magnet program. I was in the, um, prior to that, I was in the gifted program, um, space program where I had to take a little short bus to different schools before I elevated to that. And so when I graduated, I think I had like a 3.96 GPA. This is before we had all these AP courses. So my school didn't have all the AP courses and I get this scholarship and I go to the University of Alabama. And I'm in a, actually, um, an honors program at my university. And so in this honors program, of course, now I'm in a bigger pond where everybody's coming from these different schools. And, you know, now I have to level set myself to my new environment again. And I remember sitting in the classroom and we were going through the reading requirements to write a paper for um, a, a specific topic that we were talking about. It was an interdisciplinary topic. I think it was science and religion on a pale blue dot. I remember it. I remember it. Ada Long. I love Ada Long if you're ever listening. She's the best professor ever. She's retired now. But anyway, so we're looking at the required um, reading list and there was, a, there was a list of books on there and I didn't recognize any of them. And so my classmates were like, oh, you didn't read that? We read that in the ninth grade. I wrote a paper on that in the 10th grade. I wrote a paper on this in the 11th grade. And I'm like, what? I've never even heard of any of these books. And I didn't write any papers on anything until, you know, my senior 11th grade, senior year. And so then I started to realize, okay, wait a minute. What is this like GPA that I have really saying? What education did I really get? because now I'm seeing the world open up and I don't have all the tools. Now I realize I don't have the tools and I have to go back, you know, go backwards and catch up so that I can at least compete. So I had to work harder. And I, and of course I was on scholarship, so I could not make, you know, any low scores or I would lose my opportunity to be in school. So I had to work harder. And that work harder, it's like, this is just one example. Yeah, one example. Um, okay, so, and I, you know, I've just got a couple more um, questions here. We kind of understand your life story a little bit now. We understand kind of some of the stuff you had to deal with and, and how you coped with things and the resiliency that slowly and kind of, you know, moved its way around. It's so I know you're a spiritual person and I hope people understand by now seeing you talk and what you talk about that you're also a spiritual person who's also very much into quantum physics as well, which is amazing because that's, we can geek out about that all day. Um, so, so now that, you know, you're L, I mean, you've always been L, but you're L here in this moment in time. And there's all of these events that are happening that, you know, are, are obviously targeted toward um, black communities, African, you know, the systems that have been around for so long, the systems that you have been in, the systems that you've um, seen, how do you, where are you when it comes to Black Lives Matter movement in terms of like, how are you, how did you cope with it initially when it happened? Like what went through your physical body and what practices did you then move into to find a sense of 
flow of some kind in this. Right. So, I mean, in terms of like the Black Lives Matter thing, it, being a Black person in the United States, especially being from Alabama, I saw these things happening all the time. So it was like, you know, normal everyday life kind of, you know, thing of thinking about this is just how Black people are treated. We just have to think about different things more, you know, when we wake up on how we're going to go through our day and stay alive. And what, uh, what are those, I'm going to interrupt for just saying, what are some of those, what are some of those things? I just, I would ask you to like name and voice them because some of those things that are different, because it's important. It's important to hear that. Oh, I can name some things I have to think about when, um, just being a black woman in a corporate environment. Yep. Okay, being a black woman in a corporate environment, I have to straighten my hair. My hair is not coming out of my head straight, straight. <laughs> it does not happen that way. It's curly. And that takes hours. I cannot imagine, and I know that it's a it's a debate, but hair is a debate in the workplace on whether it's professional or not. I cannot wear the hair that comes out of my head the way that that the universe, the source, God had it to come out of my head without processing it. It's viewed, my natural sense is viewed, my natural essence is viewed as, I guess, deplorable, unfitting, okay? If I were to go to a, the grocery store, I can't ever just roll out of bed and go to the grocery store and just like sweatpants and my hair pulled up. I actually dress myself to go to the grocery store because I don't want to be um, mistaken for someone who is stealing, for someone who is doing some type of crime. Mm -hmm. And I remember, um, I remember having a conversation with my friend, my beautiful Polish friend, Anya. And we're talking about Sandra Bland. When Sandra Bland was um, pulled over and pulled out of her car and sent to jail and she dies in, you know, in the, in the jail. I was like, oh my goodness, what if I get pulled over? You know, what if the cops do something to me? And my friend said to me, she said, don't worry about it. Because as soon as the cop hears you speak, he will know. Mm -hmm. that you're educated and that won't happen to you and I had you know and she and she and then she said then she offered to me she said you know what and I'm also I'm, I should get you a radar detector because you know I am worried right <laughs> and don't speed right <laughs> but but when she said that to me a light bulb went off in my head what what if I, you know, so I have to be able to speak for someone to recognize that I'm a human being that should not be, you know, hurt, you know, that you shouldn't put any violence against me <laughs> because I'm a human being. No, I have to be a certain type of human being, right? And so every day, just the basic stuff, the basic stuff stuff in terms of appearance, in terms of education, appearing to, to be educated, to appearing to be um, not the angry black woman, you know, not too loud. And I am, you know, pretty loud, but, you know, not too assertive. I can't be assertive, you know, sassy. You know, those are like really really subtle things that most people don't have to think about at all. They just wake up and be themselves. You can, you know, wake up and just go out with wet hair and go to, you know, work and say, oh, I'm having a bad day today. No one will stop the meeting. Yeah. Yeah, that's the world, unfortunately. <laughs> I know. And that's a shitty world. That's a shit world, too. I say a couple, a couple of the profanities there. Um, so when you look at how you deal with it, how you dealt with it, how you continue to work with 
racism, systemic racism. I mean, shit's everywhere. It's everywhere. What do you do? What, what, what works for you to keep you in a place where you've got some type of balance in the internal landscape? and some type of way to relate to the external environment in a way that helps your heart and your mind. You know, when I saw the officer put his knee on George Floyd's neck for all those minutes, it hurt my soul to the core, like the, to be so nonchalant with a hand in the pocket Snuffing out the life of a human being without a care. That, you know, watching that and seeing that in my mind, a person who looks like me, a person who looks like somebody in my family, a person who looks like somebody who is an ancestor of mine, being thought of with little regard that his life meant nothing. Regardless, I don't care. Twenty dollars. There's a judge and jury for that. Twenty dollars. Somebody's life is not, you know, worth twenty dollars. Oh, possibly, you know, they have to defame you. Possibly, maybe some some substances involved. Oh, possibly, there was a previous crime ten years ago involved. Oh, possibly this and possibly that. That you. To it, it, it's just to create this illusion that human beings don't exist regardless of their circumstance. One person doesn't get an opportunity or one person doesn't get the right to snuff out your life. So to me and, and what I practice, we're all human beings vibrating and oscillating and we're moving at our own frequency. We're we're here and we're in balance with the universe and the trees and the bees and the, you know, the minerals, the rocks, everybody's vibrating with the stars and the sun, right? We are, we're, we're an illusion. We're actually not necessarily here. You want to hear me talk about physics <laughs> entanglement. So we are, we're like, we're not here. And so when I look at it with this type of, when we when I look at it with this type of lens, I I feel like okay, the things that happen in society don't necessarily matter because you know we're only here for a split second in time. You know, we're light beings that are all connected, and this is just a part of the chaos to get us back to the flow and balance of where we are. That's that's what I want to to feel about it. And when I sit down in myself and I connect during meditation, that's where I go. Because through my eyes, I can just see and feel love, you know? But at the same time, I know that these other things are happening and that we can't have a, a free flow of love. We can't have that free flow of love to all when love isn't given to all so when i when i get in chaos and turmoil i do the same thing that i did when i was in first grade i sit down and i imagine myself and being in that space and i reach out into the universe into the source to feel me with the next steps and how i can move myself into a better place to make a difference to make that flow happen. I am an instrument in the orchestra. I am an instrument playing a symphony, right? Strings vibrating. And I got to play my notes in this song. And so I got to move my body and get myself there to do my job. And what I, whatever I can do to make this song continue to play. So that's how I do with it. <laughs> you talk and it's poetry. 
how that's to deal with it. Yeah. Thank you all. I appreciate it. And, and, and I appreciate, you know, you talking about this and talking about your childhood, you know, the, the lovely memories and the connections and the, you know, the other, the other bad experiences and everything. Cause I know that when you talk about this stuff, you do in a way relive it in some capacity. So I do really appreciate your time because as you mentioned, we're playing an instrument in a symphony. Is that how you said it? You said a, a shit ton better than I just did, but you're playing a, an instrument and, and you know, time in this third dimensional reality is all we have. So for you to spend your time with me and to, you know, bring your energy out and your thoughts out for everyone else to connect with. Um, that's, that's pretty spectacular. So I appreciate you doing that. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to say all before we, before we top off? I was just actually listening to all the things that you were saying. Cause I didn't know that I said all that. <laughs> <laughs> In conversation. Yes, girl. Yes. We talked about all this. I'll have to listen to it to see what was said. <laughs> <laughs> that's why it's powerful it's like you know for everybody who's watching and listening if you're in chicago find l um you know affirmative health and healing like this is she's the girl for it and you are in her presence and you just feel calm like you just feel like i can take a breath and what's even more magnificent l is that to know that you take your breath and you create that space to, to work with the outside world and you have your, your, your strength and your, your skills to, to keep you. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And you know what? We all have the strength and the skills. We just have to remember. Yeah. We just have to remember that we do have it and actually utilize it and use it to move forward because, you know, even though the world is crazy, we all have our own things to deal with in our own personal lives. Then we have to connect to the, the world outside of our lives. And it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. So if we all just tap in and be able to relieve ourselves, because if we don't do it, it manifests in physical, physical pain, you know, illness and disease, autoimmune disease, stress, fatigue, you know, shoulder, neck pain. It's so many, different, so many different things. Shorten lives. We don't want to shorten our lives. We want to vibrate on until we can anymore. But it's just really important that we all take our health seriously, especially during these times of ultimate stress. Yeah. You know? and, and, and you are very talented. You live in the world that you're a chemist and you are a hypnotherapist and an herbologist or herbalist. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. So you are in, you're, you're vibing at two different worlds and you're doing it like freaking amazingly. So I appreciate you. And, uh, and like I said, there will be more interviews to come on different topics and different subjects, um, with, uh, with YSC. So thank you for taking your time out. I appreciate you. Yes. Thank you so much, Rajni. Um,